Um, and I really like the question about, um, so what uh, tools do I need in my toolkit um, to be a data scientist? And I'm going to kind of take this in a whole different direction um, <clears throat> and talk about some tools and, and some, some aspects of being a data scientist that maybe um, are new or hopefully are at least interesting um, to think about for, for you guys. So uh, my background is in healthcare, um, primarily working with a lot of um, clinical staff on the development of tools that, that use data to make better decisions. And um, that was kind of tied in with my, my career as an academic researcher as well. Um, oh, okay. Is that, is that better? Okay. Um, and that was tied in with my um, career as an academic researcher as well, where we would do a lot of research on um, various aspects of healthcare and then try and make that feed into tools that we could then push out to um, clinicians and physicians and other healthcare professionals. And um, so one of my perspectives is, um, is working a lot on that kind of front line with clinical staff who weren't really versed in, in data science or even, you know, using data or understanding data necessarily, but they really wanted to still have some value from it and, and gain something from the data that, that they were collecting. All right, so audience uh, participation time. So I just want you guys to yell out or suggest what are some valuable skills that you guys think a data scientist needs to have, or it could be an analytics professional or somebody who works with data, data engineering. What do you guys think? Yell it out. Yeah, yell it out, yell it out. Okay, sorry, what, what was over there? Critical thinking. Critical thinking, okay. Knowing what data you have and have not. Okay, knowing data, yeah. Being able to tell the story about the data you have. Being able to tell a story, yeah, yeah, that's great. What else? Curiosity, absolutely. Soft skills. Soft skills. All right, so perfect. All right, we'll end on, we'll end on that note because that's, that's a perfect segue into the next slide. So what are some valuable skills for a designer? And when I say designer, um, I want you guys to think of whatever you think of when, you say, when I say designer. So if you guys watch a lot of HDTV and you love to see those home flipping shows and interior designers at work, um, that could be a designer or a web designer or a UX designer. What do you guys think are important skills there? Creative thinking. Sorry, what was? Sense of beauty. Sense of beauty. Aesthetics. Okay. Innovation. User experience. Sorry, what was that? Identifying the problem. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, what was that? Minimization. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Those are those are excellent. Being able to draw. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It helps. It helps. No doubt. Um, all right. Yeah. Those are excellent suggestions. So. I think what I want to get at with the talk tonight is just actually to maybe convince you that some of the things we do as a data scientist and some of the things that a designer does are actually not so different and some of the skills that they use in their professions we can actually leverage as a data scientist. So um, both of these domains, so when we're talking about designers versus data scientists, um, they mainly function in an applied context. So we don't really do design in theory, we're usually doing design for a particular purpose. Uh, design in theory is kind of more like what an artist does. Um, and same thing as a data scientist, we don't really operate in a theoretical framework. We are always trying to apply to a specific problem and in a specific context. Uh, the work on both of these, I would argue, often begins with ambiguity, and we have a lot of different possibilities. Uh, we have to know what data we have and what data we don't have, and sometimes that's not always very clear at the, at the beginning. Um, for a designer, they come into a room and there's a million different things they can do with it and they have to somehow narrow that, that huge space down into a few concrete possibilities that, that their client actually wants to, to get out of it. Um, success in both cases greatly depends on understanding the problem. So we have to know what is the problem we're solving, who are the people involved, and how can we tie those two things together. And oftentimes in both cases there's a lot of iteration and testing. So a designer might go through a lot of different um, prototypes, a lot of different sketches, a lot of different mock-ups before they get to a solution. And as a data scientist, we also tend to go through that process a lot, even trying to discover what data we have and what, what we can try to do with it. Okay, so soft skills for data science and design. So I'm just gonna touch on a few tonight, um, but obviously there's way more and we could do a huge um, you know, <laughs> lecture series on this. Um, the first is uh, empathy. And I'll go through a little bit about what that means and, and maybe some cases of how we can apply it in data science. Problem framing, so that came up as one of the suggestions. So understanding the problem that we're actually talking about 
and maybe taking an existing problem and reframing it when we, we don't think we can solve the problem that we're facing. And then creativity. So how do we think a little bit outside the box? How do we innovate? How do we do something that hasn't been done before? Okay, so empathy. Fundamentally, this is you know, understanding someone else's perspective and motivation. And we always say, you know, put yourself in someone's shoes and try and understand where they're coming from. And um, definitely, this is a skill that can be learned and exercised. Um, and when I say empathy here, I'm not necessarily talking about an emotional connection, but it's, it's really trying to understand the world from somebody's perspective or, or their day-to-day -day life. And so we talk about going into a business and understanding what problem is really annoying for someone. Um, that's, that's essentially empathy, trying to understand what, what they need right now at, at any given time. And so in practice, um, this comes up in a lot of different cases. So artists use empathy to kind of capture and relay an emotional experience to someone. And so there you are trying to make that emotional connection with your audience. Uh, designers use empathy a lot to define and solve a problem. So in this case, understanding that you know, some people need stairs and uh, other people need a ramp. And that's, that's empathy. That's understanding what someone needs and then integrating that into a, a very elegant solution. And uh, for a data scientist, um, my, my own view on this is that we often sit between a lot of different groups, um, kind of somewhat along the lines of what's already been, been discussed tonight. And so we really have to understand each of these different perspectives as we sit in the middle and try and make sense of where all this is coming from. And, um, and so you can see that actually captured pretty nicely in this, where we've got four different groups that all have a different idea of what bread means, but they're all going for it, right? And they all want it. So we, as data scientists, kind of have to do that a little bit, uh, I think, as well. All right, and so to see an example of this in practice. So I don't think anybody would um, appreciate having parking information laid out like this. I don't think that's anybody's first choice. Um, can anybody actually tell me if we can park there at a, on a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock in the evening? Or what are we, 6.45 in the evening? Took a bit of time, but yeah, uh, you, you can figure it out. It takes a little while. You have to sift through a lot of different information. So um, this is a really interesting use case from a, a graphic designer who just decided she was living in New York. She was tired of this. So she put together a much cleaner, much more easily interpretable um, parking schedule. And you know, I, I don't know if you agree with me. I think this should be the standard <laughs> around the world. Probably won't happen anytime soon. but. Um, Fundamentally, like this was a problem she was solving for herself, but she understood very clearly what the problem was, and she had empathy for the people who were pulling up to these no parking zones, trying to figure out you know, whether they can actually park there or not. And so how to be empathetic, well, I, or empathic rather. So I think the, the key to this, for me anyway, uh, is to ask a lot of questions and to really try and listen to the answers. And sometimes, you might even have to ask the same question over and over and people start getting annoyed with you because they feel like you don't really understand what's going on. But it's really important to clarify and, and really understand what uh, the, the conversation that you're having with somebody about, about these problems that we're trying to solve as data scientists. And the other thing that I think is really key is um, remaining objective and refraining from immediate solutioning is, is a critical. A lot of times we like to jump in and just like solve a problem and we have our, our head down trying to solve it right off the bat. But we may not be solving the right problem, or we may not understand completely what the problem is before we kind of jump into a solution. And then obviously trying to connect you know, what you're hearing or what you're getting back from, from someone to your own experience is really helpful. So it may not be that you're an expert in the same domain, but you might have come across an analogous situation that you can kind of use from your own experience um, to, to understand wh what's going on for this, this person. What are they, they struggling with at this point? All right, so we'll move on to problem framing. So problem framing, um, this is, I think sums it up pretty nicely. So this is a, a quote from Tukey that's actually um, quite, quite aged now. It's uh, 1962, so it's, it's been around a little while. But he was already thinking about, in this um, paper, he was thinking about all of the struggles and the, the challenges that we're facing today before they were even using you know, all of our technologies and tools. And um, he was basically saying that it's better to actually have the right question in mind and get kind of a vague or uncertain ans answer than to answer the wrong question and get it exactly right. Um, because the wrong question is, is not, not really useful at the end of the day. 
And so uh, Roger Peng, who's um, uh, a professor with the university in the, in the States, he writes a blog about, about various insights on, on data science and analytics and statistics. And so he took this idea and he kind of created this, um, I'll, I'll call it like a, a bit of a journey map for a data scientist. And the interesting thing about this is, um, you know, he, he sort of thinks that usually we, we start thinking that we've got this great question that we're asking and trying to solve. Um, but oftentimes it feels like we're actually starting way, way off the mark on our question. We actually have to evolve the question kind of as we do our work and as we iterate and as we uh, learn more. And so he really thinks that this, this kind of meandering journey is, is our job or our role as data scientists is to go from this question that is maybe not, not really what we want to do or not really what we want to answer and try and improve upon that as we go through. And I'll extend this idea a little bit by kind of laying this on its side and saying, okay, so we've got quality of question and strength of evidence. And the other thing I think that often comes into play is an abundance of data. So sometimes we might have a really great question. We might have a little bit of really great evidence, but maybe we just don't have the data we think we have or we don't have the data that we want. So now we're kind of constrained by, you know, not having the data to answer the question anymore. So really, you know, oftentimes we're probably starting all the way down there with, you know, little data a really unclear or ambiguous question um, and not a lot of evidence and the job is to really try and get all the way up there where we're gathering all the data we need, we're asking the right questions and we're getting that, that strong evidence. So how do we do this? Um, so one uh, suggestion that I would make is I, th I think we can benefit um, in this case from engaging in problem framing. And um, it's easier to, I think, kind of illustrate some, some tools that are, are useful in problem framing rather, rather than trying to define problem framing. Um, there's definitely no one way to do it. And I think that there's a lot of different approaches you can take and probably it's a matter of trying some things and seeing what works. So one really, um, I think, common tool and, and you probably learned about this even in, in uh, grade school is kind of the five W's and the H. So the, you know, the who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, and so again, just asking those questions and really listening to the answers and trying to understand the problem, trying to understand the data, trying to understand the people involved. And um, obviously these are just examples, but I mean, you can ask tons of different questions around this. Uh, another tool that's quite useful is immersion. So this is where we think about actually almost like job shadowing. You go into an environment and you just like embed yourself right in the problem with all the people who are working on it day to day and you try and learn and understand um, from observing them and from recording what's going on. What, what are they trying to, to accomplish? What information do they need? Um, what are some pain points? What are some roadblocks that they're constantly trying to overcome? And another one that is really useful when you've got a lot of people, a lot of different people involved is personas. Um, so this is kind of making an archetypal sketch of, of stakeholders and use, users. You might think of it almost like a bit of a stereotype where you're trying to understand, okay, who are the different groups of people that, that I'm interacting with on a daily basis? Are those people technical? Are they non-technical? Um, do they come from a very similar background where they're all, you know, say from engineering or maybe some of them come from an MBA program? Um, that's really helpful even just to be able to understand the kind of language that those people might be speaking and how can you talk to them on their own terms. And for me, the ultimate in problem reframing is actually problem elimination, where you reframe the problem to such an extent that it just simply disappears. So this is a little bit of an example from some work that I did um, in research at the University of Calgary. And so we developed uh, an automated system to do analysis of, of human movement when people were walking and running on a treadmill. And we had to do um, different analyses depending on whether they were walking or running. So we had to have a detection method to figure out, okay, is this person running or walking? And then we would basically get the corresponding analysis. Now the problem was um, the data weren't always labeled correctly or the system didn't work properly or something would happen and we'd get a little bit of a mix up. And sometimes it would say, well, this running person was really walking and then we wouldn't end up with a running analysis. We'd end up with a really wonky walking analysis that doesn't work. Um, and vice versa for you know, our, our walking cases what that were labeled as running. So what we did was we said, okay, well, gait, gait and you know, human movement really happens at, at speeds. There, there's just, all we're really looking at is a range of speeds here. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're walking or running. It really matters 
um, where you are on that continuum. So we just created a system that looked at their speed. And instead of having this kind of false dichotomy of walking and running, we just changed it into um, a continuous condition. And then we had one single analysis that merely depended upon um, how fast they were moving. It didn't care whether it's walking or running. So in this case, we kind of changed our attack, angle of attack on the problem and eliminated this uh, mislabeling or this kind of false dichotomy in the data that we were running into. All right, so the last uh, point that I'll touch on is creativity. And, um, you know, it, it's hard to define creativity, I think, but I think we all know it when we see something creative, when we see something that's new and interesting and fascinating. Um, so it's this kind of generative process from which we get something new. And even if you think you're not a creative person, this can definitely be learned and exercised. And um, I think we've all probably come across this quote, which is often attributed to Edison, that genius is really 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And um, I threw up this painting here because it's actually a really interesting story about how that came about. At, at least the story that I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's interesting anyway, so I'll go with it. But um, the, the painter was apparently walking one day um, right around sunset, and there was this beautiful scene in front of him with mountains and the setting sun and all these colors. And for whatever reason, he, uh, he all of a sudden felt this huge wave of anxiety and he, he felt scared and he felt anxious for the future and he felt all of these things that I don't think any of us would associate with a beautiful sunset. And so what he did was he took that feeling and he kind of internalized it and he wrote about it and he thought about it and then he just started working some images that came, came to his mind. And uh, it took a lot of iterations actually, he did a lot of different versions of this but eventually this is, this is what came out of it. Um, and so to me this is a really interesting example of, you know, the painter was aware that what he experienced was kind of this unusual, strange sensation, and, and he used it, he, he kind of took it and used it to, to make something creative or make something new that I don't think any of us would, would have really expected to come out of a, a beautiful sunset. And so I think, you know, the bottom line from that story to me is that creativity is, is really work. It's having the inspiration, yes, but then it's going and, and actually doing the work to work that idea. Um, and turn it into something. And, and I think that's a lot of the times that's what designers and artists are doing. They're working an idea until they get something new and interesting and fascinating that they, they really want to share with the world. And one important skill, um, I think, to creativity is to avoid that early stopping. And we talked a little bit about this in, in problem framing too. You don't necessarily want to jump to a solution right away. You want to uh, make sure you're working that idea long enough that you can really get to that, you know, that really cool new concept that, that you want to get to. And I think one of the other keys is to generate a lot of ideas and constantly evaluating them and testing them as you go along. And pro prototyping is one, you know, great way of achieving this. And I don't know if you guys have heard the story of the, the Palm Pilot, the precursor to, you know, all the phones that are in our pockets right now. Um, but Jeff Hawkins, who was one of the founders of Palm, he, legend has it, he basically carried around this wooden tablet with a computer printout on it, and he would um, take it out at meetings, and he'd pretend like he was entering things in his schedule. He'd pretend to write on it, he'd pretend to draw on it. People thought he was crazy for carrying around a piece of wood and trying to write on it, but um, the point of it was, he really wanted to see whether people would even use this thing, right? Whether it was something that was valuable or not. Um, and so the, the value of prototyping, I think, can't be overstated, and especially for us, you know, I think as a data scientist, the, the goal would be, you know, to find a simple way to try and test an idea and make sure that it works. What's the smallest kind of subset of data or the smallest subset of a, a project that we can really work on to figure out, okay, yeah, this has value and, and this is something that, that people want. And so harnessing creativity, well, that's, I think that's the challenge. Um, you know, some suggestions and, and these are certainly not an exhaustive list, but um, don't get too caught up in your ideas. So, you know, if we jump into an idea and we feel like, you know, yeah, this is the one and, and, and I know this is gonna be the greatest idea, you know, you really have to be critical or you have to get those outside perspectives or you have to get some sort of validation that, yeah, this is, this is the right idea to pursue and this is, this is the direction we wanna go. And to that point as well, testing and validating your ideas as much as possible. So talking to others, prototyping, um, you know, trying to get some, some of that outside feedback is really important. And, you know, in, in the world of, of business, uh, this obviously has to be balanced uh, with the time spent and, and the time constraints that you have on a project. But, um, you know, that's, that's unfortunately kind of 
one of the constraints that we often operate against where we have to be creative up to a point and then we kind of have to say, okay, this is, this is the idea we have to run with, but hopefully we've gotten far enough in that iterative uh, cycle that we can, we can get the right idea out. And so I just put this up there. So this is, to kind of put this a little bit into perspective, um, this is kind of my, my view of, of the, the time that you know, we spend on a typical project. Um, on the, the left-hand side, you can see the, the CRISP-DM framework, which is something that we often talk about at Mosaic, and this is how we kind of frame the, the workflow that we use where we're iterating on all of these different components. But to me, I was, when I was kind of preparing this, I was, I was interested to just go in and look at, you know, how much time do I think I spend on all these different components and where do I think soft skills versus analytical skills can really be meaningful um, at these different uh, places in the, in the process. And I, I was kind of actually a little bit surprised that, you know, it turned out that soft skills are kind of important for a huge chunk of uh, the different phases that, that a project goes through. And so that was kind of interesting to me and I, I think it maybe suggests that um, soft skills are, are a really valuable part, not just of you know, early conversations, but kind of as you go through the project and you're iterating and, and going through these different um, prototypes or different um, stages, then uh, you can use those soft skills at a lot of different places. So maybe I've convinced you to practice those soft skills, hopefully, but uh, if not, I'm happy to you know, have discussion and, and hear more from you guys about how, how you think these might uh, play into your different uh, career paths. So thank you very much. Okay, so the, the question was, did I, where did I learn my soft skills or how did I come by these? Um, so yeah, I, I primarily learned them, I would say working with, um, w working in the healthcare field with clinical staff was, was kind of the biggest learning experience for me. Um, partly because, um, you know, medicine, medicine's kind of funny. Um, there's a lot of different perspectives on medicine and it's also a very high stakes, high risk kind of field and so, um, it's really important to understand, if you're talking to a physician, it's really important to understand what that physician's perspective is if you're ever gonna convince him that he needs to integrate some kind of new tool um, into his practice. Um, so there's a lot of, and, and maybe that's true of other fields as well, but in healthcare there's a lot of resistance that has to be overcome. And so for me, kind of learning on the job how to frame things and um, empathize and you know, get to the right problem um, was, was sort of a learning experience that I went through there. Okay, so the question was, small team, you've got a lot of different perspectives for, for how to move forward and how do you, how do you kind of handle that? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, usually the bottom line, I think, for, for kind of, if you're talking from like a, a managing perspective, like managing that kind of dynamic, I think, I think the bottom line would come to, you know, what, what is the question that's being answered and what, what is the approach that makes the most sense for the question? So it's, it's fine to have um, a lot of different perspectives and ideas, but at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that there's alignment between the question that you're trying to solve and, and the perspective that you're, you're providing. So it, exactly, and, and you know, the way that you can, if you really don't know and it's unclear you know, what the perspective, the best perspective is, then I think that's where the opportunity to prototype becomes really valuable, right? Because if you can, if you could test out all those different ideas and find one that's you know, a winner, um, for, for obvious reasons, whatever that may be, then, then that would be the way to kind of um, uh, move forward if, if it was really unclear as to you know, whether one was better aligned or not. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, that, it's a tough problem. I honestly like, because the natural, the natural course for, and sorry, the question was how, how, do, you, how do you factor in the, the time problem when you're trying to try out all these different approaches or try out all these different ideas? Um, the, the natural course for like design thinking and, and these kind of creative approaches is you kind of just want to iterate forever, right? And you want to keep working the idea um, until you get it perfect and, and that doesn't work in the real world. So um, the, the, from a data science perspective, uh, again, like the, uh, for me, the, the way to really validate your ideas or understand when you're approaching a good solution is if it's possible to prototype and to try and get that small use case or that small validation that says, yeah, we've got we've gone as far as we need to. We've got maybe uh, a solution that's, that's far enough along that we can pursue it further. Um, that would be kind of my, my thought or, or maybe getting that outside perspective where um, maybe the business or the, the client tells you 
this is it, this is what I want. Like you've gone far enough. Um, this is the idea that, that we want to run with, yeah. Okay, that's a good question. So how do you, um, how would you present uh, um, a data use case to an expert and maybe the data use case is counterintuitive or it runs counter to their logic or it's something that they wouldn't expect, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, th I think the easiest way is, is if you can still, if you can show them that it solves their problem or if you can show them that it generates some kind of benefit or return, that'll always go a long ways um, towards maybe convincing them that, okay, this is, this is the way to go. To kind of argue it just based on, y you know, the, f the fact of the data or, the, you know, this data is correct and, and that's why it's, it's the way to go, um, I think is always maybe a little more difficult. Um, but certainly in, in, in healthcare, showing them that it has a benefit for, you know, whether it's um, patient care or reducing costs or making the doctor's life easier, um, th those are easy ways to kind of start to convince them of the benefits, yeah. yeah. So, so I think um, I might actually just uh, call it there and, and uh, I'll hand everything over to, to Priya now, but I'm happy to chat more definitely after, uh, after the next presentation. So thank you again.